Hi and welcome to my most anticipated read of the decade, I'm not gonna lie. I have not been this excited for a book since probably high school. Something about Sean McGuire I just fall head over heels for, and that's particularly true for the middle game, a chemical journey, a sort of series, a world building, or whatever you want to call it. Needless to say, I was super excited when Macmillan Audio and NetGalley granted me an audio arc of seasonal fears to read and review for you all. I have so much I'd like to say. <laughs> the big question is, does it live up to its predecessor, Middle Game? Is it everything we wanted it to be and more? I guess the only way to find that out that is to stick around and watch my review. So, this is spoiler free, to be clear. The review itself, I'm going to try my best to avoid most of the plot. I feel like it's more fun to go on the journey and learn what's going on, partly because this book, well, honestly, the series in general, it's about the journey, right? I mean, it's literally called the Alchemical Hill Journeys series, or it's how it's labeled in Goodreads anyways. And in the first book, we follow Roger and Darger as they come to find out that they are these creations, these alchemical men or creations. It's complicated. Three, three of the first book, if you really want to know. And basically they were created to harness certain power of the universe. And what we get thrust into in Mill Game is their story, um, basically intertwined through different timelines. We're basically plugged in the middle of the story, but we get introduced at the end of one, the end of one timeline, the beginning of a new one. And the idea there is we're getting a glimpse of what's going on, and we slowly walk through everything that's going on in Middle Game. Jump into book two, and I was really curious where we'd go, because I knew we weren't just gonna get Roger and Dodger's next tales. But part of me really wanted that story, just copy and paste it and be done again. It's not what we get. And to be clear, I think that was the right choice. I think as much as I'm the kind of person who loves to overindulge in the same thing over and over again, it would make for an objectively worse book if she just copied that and made it again. Instead, we get a wholly new narrative, but also a wholly new take on the story itself, meaning the structure, the intent, I think, behind Seasonal Fears is fundamentally different than Middle Game. Middle Game was this epic, uh, sort of non-linear narrative that is slowly revealing what's going on about the world and about our characters. And it's very character-driven as much as it is world-driven. But it felt as if it was much more about understanding our characters than it was the world itself. Now we move on to book two, Seasonal Fears here, and I feel like her intent has shifted. It's less character-driven than it is about exploring the world. Honestly, I felt as if book two of the Middle Game series, of, of Alchemical Journeys, was more entwined with the, what do you call this? I want to say it was the Up and Under series, the Impossible Road series, the series of, of novels or sorry, no, novellas made by A. Deborah Baker in the series. She's an alchemical person and it's sort of her non-direct guide to alchemical arts. And we get to see the continuation of the intertwining between the quote-unquote real world and this fictional world into this next book, but it feels more deliberate. It feels as if she is intentionally woven in the, the threads of this series into the alchemical journey's world more deliberately. I think part of that probably is I don't think she intended to, to write this book when she wrote Middle Game. I think she just wrote an, a book and then afterwards decided she's going to write this one, made a full book out of it. Now we get Seasonal Fears, which I assume was written, intertwined with this book and the sequel to this book, which is already out, and the third and fourth are coming out as well. Meaning, I can see how the two fed back into each other. Instead of having Middle Game feeding into this book, we have probably both books feeding into each other. And I thought it made for a much more... I don't want to say much more engrossing because they're both really engrossing, but it was really engrossing on its own because of that. Objectively, I could see some people not liking Seasonal Fears as much because of the fact that it's more focused on the world than it is on the characters themselves. It is very plot-driven. It's very much about the world and understanding the world better. There's a lot of opportunity for exposition going on. Don't get me wrong, there's characters at the center that we're supposed to care about, and we, we do. I just don't think, I don't think the structure is intended to be that way. There's a tweet that I'm gonna try and find again and, and post for you here, where Sean McGar actually talks about, right before this is coming out, about how 
the, what she would put into this book was different than the first book. She says it's one less personal, but also it's more about the world building, I believe is what she said. And I was like, yes, thank you. Thank you for confirming what my feelings were. It's like, I, when I thought about what it is she was trying to get at here, this is what I felt was the intent. And I think it's very, very apparent. I think it makes for a fun ride, especially when I go back and revisit all these books. It's going to be a lot of fun to go from the middle game, then to this one. This a whole new direction that she goes in as far as the type of story it's being told. But more than that, the plotting. So in the first book, I talk about Roger and Dodger, right? Being these creations, these kind of comical creations with the intent to harness some power of the universe. We no longer have that kind of story. We do have twins. Every single story that Sean McGuire writes has a twin in it, I believe. But we're not following twins here. We're following a boyfriend and girlfriend. They seem to be related to something in the alchemical arts and we have to figure out what it is or as they figure it out as well. And they're on this journey to sort of come to that realization and reach their full potential in the same way Roger and Dodger are intended to do in the first book. But it's not the same type of role as Roger and Dodger. Roger and Dodger are harnessing a particular type of nature of the universe. And part of the world building of book two is realizing there are other aspects of the universe that need to be harnessed here that, that are being embodied in some way or some form through alchemical means or tangential to alchemical. I mean, it's not strictly like alchemists doing all the work here. It's, just, it's more than that. And this is taking us in a, in a branch of that where we start to get to explore new parts of the world and better appreciate what it means to be the embodiment of something at all I mean, what the, what exactly is at the foundation of this world. I feel like there's so much potential here in this world building to explore more and more. And I really, really hope we get to see that. And while I'll be honest, I, I do prefer the character-driven world building that goes on in the first book, I would be happy to, you know, gobble down dozens more of books just like Seasonal Fears. Seasonal Fears, ultimately, I gave, I think it was, four to four and a half stars. I really, really, really wanted it to be a full five stars. It doesn't make it a bad book that it's not. But ultimately, it's just, it's not middle game. And that's okay. I don't think it was in her intent, as she says in her tweets. But more than that, like, I mean, I felt as if I was in the middle game world. And I did not want to leave that. As soon as I left Seasonal Fears, I, I did not want to read anything else. Like, why am I reading anything at all anymore? I read the best book I could read in the decade. So what's the point of even bothering? Like, I know that's being you know, dramatic. But honestly, even if it wasn't the height of perfection, I didn't want to read anything else. And part of me still doesn't. And I try not to think about it because otherwise I just want to go back to listen to that one over and over again when I know other books that have different values for me to appreciate. But really the big reason that I gave it four to four and a half stars wasn't that it was necessarily not character driven or that it wasn't a time travel story, that it was more lineal, linear. All these things on a personal level aren't as effective, meaning the everything that went into middle game, the sibling relationship, the time travel, the non-linear narrative, the intersection of science and, and fantasy, those weren't just fun characteristics. They worked for me on a personal level and in, in a way that made the book work way more effectively just because it's a per there's a personal interest of mine that really hooked me in, as I'm sure it's true for some of you as well. And the fact that the next book doesn't have that isn't a bad thing, but I think it does affect how it resonates to me on a personal level even if it doesn't affect the quality of the book. For me, the reason I couldn't give it four and a half to five stars, or you know, like pushing up to five stars, ultimately, the and I felt as if it, the ending was almost anticlimactic because of that. As disappointed as I am to say that, like I still love the book and I still am gonna reread it, but I can't feel anticlimactic about the end and give a book full five stars. I hate saying that. I feel so embarrassed. I feel ashamed to be saying this, but that's the truth. I loved this book. I absolutely loved it. Was it perfect? No. Will I read it again and again and again? Yes, yes, yes. I honestly wanted to read this book twice before I talked to you all, but I didn't because I have other books I need to read. I resisted the urge to read it twice, but it's, I'm, I, I'll be shocked if I get to the summer without rereading that book and probably the first book as well. Probably read them both in tangent, in tandem. What do you call it? One than the other. I know words. I can speak. As far as other nitpicks that I might have for the series, I like our main characters. Although the boyfriend and the in the end of relationship, I didn't always love him. I, I don't know. Like we're st they're supposed to be likable, but I found him a little too controlling. Like there's a reason behind it. He loves his girlfriend a lot, but it just feels a little too controlling for my taste. I just, 
oh, wait, I can't go without talking to you about the narrator. I was granted an audio of this book, audio arc of this book. It's the same narrator as the first book, that is Amber Benson. You all may know her if you are a fan of Buffy as Tara from Buffy. And honestly, I did not recognize her voice. I did not even realize it for the first couple times I read Millgame. But when I did, like, I, it was there. Uh, what I didn't realize was that Tara in Buffy is a character herself. Like, obviously she's a character in this literal sense. But she's a character for Amber Benson, I think, as well. And if you listen closely, I think you can hear Tara at, for some characters in this book, in both books, that is to say. But what I realize now is that her real voice, her natural voice, I assume, is just different. And I think it's 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 not as obvious as I was expecting for it to be Tara. That was for the first book. My, my feelings for Amber Benson is that she's as amazing in this one as she is in the first one. But I just want to highlight the fact that one, she's super talented, fantastic narration. But if you didn't realize it, Amber Benson narrates these series. I just, I, I think to myself, the, the arc of my life, how I could love something so much and how they intersect in moments like this. It's just so funny how these things happen. It makes me so happy when I think to myself that Tara, AKA Amber Benson is narrating these books. And she does a phenomenal job. Audio is amazing. Like I said, I'll be listening to it again. If you haven't heard the audio, I highly recommend it. A big picture, should you read Seasonal Fears if you liked Middle Game? I mean, yes. I, I honestly don't care if you don't like it. You need to spend your money so that I can get more alchemical journeys. But realistically, honestly, if you need strong characters to really like a book, this one might not work as well for you. I mean, the characters are there, but like I said, it's the focus of the book is on the world opening. It's for people who are passionate about this world, who want to see the world grown. I think there's a sweet spot between world building and characterization. It's not a bad book because it doesn't meet my personal idea of a sweet spot. It still makes for a super fun book and really engaging and one that I think any fan of this world will love. Just know that going in. That's the biggest, I think the biggest flaw, maybe the slightly anticlimactic conclusion. I haven't seen other people say that, but I honestly just feel that was the case, and which made me sad. Like I, I, just, I was looking for something to make my heart wrench and think, oh no, I can't. Even, I'm not even sure how much of what I just said is going to be kept in here because I, I can't say truly how I felt. Because I think like that reveals certain things about the plot, and I'm supposed to be spoiler free here. It's just story went in the direction that wasn't as effective as the first book. Okay, that's enough critical reviews of this book. It's amazing. It's spectacular. I hope you read it. We wouldn't if you do read it. Please let me know your thoughts and what you thought about the different take on the world. And if you're excited by the prospect of more books in the series, which I have heard nothing of that nature, but I'm sure if it's successful enough, Tor will give her money to make more. Let me know if you're gonna be reading Seasonal Fears. I don't see how you couldn't. I mean, it's a pretty big book. Everyone's gonna be reading it, I feel like. But so thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. If you did make it to the end, give me, let's see, give me a leaf or something relating to the seasons, since that's the name of the book and it actually hints to the story as well, but I'm not gonna say exactly how it fits in. But thanks again for watching. Have a great day and I'll see you all next time.